Um, so thanks, Phil, for the invitation. And I want to talk about um, some of the work that's gone on for the last um, 10 years or so to do with the um, IUPS Physium project, but also the European Virtual Physiological Human project, because that has been building infrastructures for computational physiology, which typically uses lumped cell models and puts them into 3D tissue environments and organ modeling. Um, but a lot of that framework, um, I think, could also be used within the cell. There's no essential difference between handling um, the structure and function at the cell level from doing the same thing at the tissue and organ level. So um, the way that the Physiome project has proceeded is to, is to be taking advantage of a lot of work at molecular <coughs> biology and systems biology, building models within either SBML or the CellML framework, putting those into cell types and then into tissue types where the, the physiological function often becomes clear at the level of the 100 micron level of a tissue motif, and then scaling those up to deal with organs, organs and organ systems, um, typically with the uh, incorporation of this tissue motif level via um, scaling up through the vascular system, 20 generations of vascular system. Um, so the framework is very much about dealing with structure and function at these scales, but typically using lump parameter models down here. And clearly it would fit very well with an attempt now to build much more structure into um, cell level function. So the, the, the approaches that we've taken have been that models at every level should be biophysically based. Um, although always acknowledging that there's a black box somewhere, um, that this framework needs to be built on model and data standards. There's no other way that you're going to get robust, reproducible um, frameworks for multi-scale modelling. And those frameworks incorporate SBML, CellML and FieldML, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and that as much as possible, we need to build automated assembly of multi-scale models to answer particular questions. Um, and to try and achieve model automated model reduction. And I think this is the one that's been least achieved and is now the most important um, problem to address. But I'd also like to make the point that along the way, the, the development of this framework has led to the development of quite a bit of new instrumentation. So very often, just as you want to keep a close link between experiment and modelling and interaction between the two, I think is also absolutely essential to be constantly thinking about building new instrumentation um, needed to make the measurements that you need for the models. So here's the, the 12 organ systems in the body and some of the models. There are now physiome projects across all 12 systems um, and all of them are multi-scale in some sense, some more than others. Um, and the approach has been to from experimental measurements to define minimum information standards um, where the experimentalists get together and define what is the information that needs to be recorded for a particular type of experiment, such as electrophysiology, et cetera, and that needs to be done by the experimentalists in conjunction with the modelers. Um, data standards, well, there's, only, there's very few of them, but clearly DICOM is a very significant standard in the imaging world, and there's others we've been developing by a signal ML. Um, and then the output of this is data repositories, and there are a number of those um, that adhere to these standards and have the appropriate annotation in the metadata, making use of ontologies and then developing APIs and web services. Then the same thing in the modelling world, the, the three standards now that are, are reasonably well developed, um, the corresponding model repositories, the use of ontologies such as Go and the foundation model of anatomy, and then the, um, the APIs and web services um, associated with these uh, repositories to make those models available to software, both for uploading and downloading. And then the last standard that forms part of this chain is the development of CDML, which is um, a community effort to develop a framework for being able to properly um, encapsulate all the processes involved in actually running the simulation. And then the various open source codes available to run um, with these standards can, can also define the simulation protocols there. So 
the challenge has been to be able to do the curation, annotation, and provide reference description of these models. Um, we've made some progress in getting journals to adopt these standards um, on a um, voluntary basis, but I think we do need to be trying to put more pressure on journals to adopt, to make sure that, ma adopt standards and make sure that when models are published, they're available in curated, annotated, electronic form for people to use um, immediately that they're published. Um, something we should probably talk more about later. And then the functional cur curation on top of that. So how well do these models actually match reality experimental data? So the Salomel framework has been around now for, for nearly 12 years. It started about the same time as the SPML effort. And it deals more with the biophysics of cells, whereas SPML is more targeted at the biochemistry reaction systems. And it's modular, so you can build libraries of modules that you can import to build more complex models. So there's a large number of curators, about 500, 500 to 600 models now in the repository, most of which are curated but not, not yet annotated. And the big effort now is on the annotation, um, but covering all areas of, of cell biology. And then these models and frameworks are used um, across many organ systems, but in one in particular has probably made the most progress, as you saw with Andrew McCulloch's talk yesterday, um, in terms of being able to link molecular processes through to cell tissue and cell tissue and organ level behaviour, um, covering these spatial scales. But usually with the cell processes, quite complex cell processes now being modelled, but with lump perimeter systems, typically. Although electron tomography data and um, other forms of 3D imaging are being used now to assemble 3D cardiac cell models, but not, I don't think they've yet had an impact in terms of higher scale function. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points. One is that the, the mathematical model often is a very useful framework for fusing data, assembling data from molecular through tissue through um, clinical scale. Um, and we do a lot of that. We, we do a lot of imaging of, with confocal microscopy of structure, and that means you can put that physiological level data into a model that's also then registered with, in the clinic with um, MR data and then likewise spatial data at the molecular level. Or physiological measurements, for example, um, spatially distributed measurements of physiological function um, can all be registered into one common framework. Um, and then the other point I'd like to make is that very often it's very useful to be building libraries of components. So for the musculoskeletal system, we build libraries of all the muscles and bones in the body with both the geometry, anatomy and the structure. And then we can assemble those into models depending on the particular use that those models are being put to for answering, in this case, biomechanics questions. Um, but this concept of these frameworks being able to build modules that you can then assemble for a particular question is important. So this is my last slide. I just want to identify what I think are the key points. One is that the model and coding standards are almost done. I don't think we have to do a lot of effort now to make use of those. Um, we, we need to do a lot of work in terms of curation and annotation and getting more community buy-in, but the standards themselves after nearly um, over 10 years of work are pretty well in place, both for lump parameter modelling and for spatial modelling. Um, but we need to do a lot more annotation and for the models in the repository so that they can be queried through web services and you can do automatic building of modules from components. Um, and that is quite a time consuming process, but the tools for doing that are now reasonably well advanced. Um, we need a lot more effort on data standards, I think, as opposed to the model standards, um, particularly around the minimum information standards for experimental data. Um, I think the major focus now should be on how to bridge scales and how to develop better algorithms for model reduction, because clearly when you're crossing these large spatial and temporal scales, you have to be able to um, do the appropriate model reduction for the questions you're asking at a, at a higher scale. Um, and then I think we need, as Phil has mentioned, we need much better incentive systems in place to encourage computational scientists to care about reproducibility 
Um, and that's, that just requires, I think that's got to be led by the journals themselves. So just to uh, acknowledge funding sources for a lot of the work that we've done. Thanks very much. Thank you.